If it wasn't such a serious issue, I would laugh at the utter absurdity of the fucking bullshit that is being thrown about. Nuclear experts are still struggling to clarify what happened at Fukushima Daiichi three years after the accident. The plant sent radioactive substances into the air above northeastern Japan. Many experts maintain that happened after hydrogen explosions. But as we hear on the latest Nuclear Watch, some have another story. NHK World's Ken Ichiro Okamoto reports. Our investigation brought us to this radiation monitoring post in Fukushima Prefecture. It's located 5.6 kilometers from the nuclear plant. The data recorded here after the nuclear accident contained some surprising information. This map shows the dispersion of radioactive cesium based on data collected after the accident. And here's the detailed data from the monitoring post. It shows a clear spike in radiation levels at 2.40 p.m. What's surprising about this surge is that it happened almost one hour before the first hydrogen explosion. And it followed a crucial operation at Fukushima Daiichi. At that time, a buildup of steam caused pressure to rise dramatically inside the reactor containment vessels. Their structural integrity was at risk. Shortly after 2 p.m., engineers opened valves to decrease the pressure in reactor 1 through a process called venting. TEPCO officials explained the amount of radioactive particles released into the atmosphere would be limited. There's water under the reactors. The steam released during venting will pass through it, so even if there are any radioactive particles, the amount that comes out will be very low. Here's how TEPCO described the venting process at that time. The steam building up inside the reactors would pass through a water tunnel. The water was supposed to act as a filter that would capture radioactive particles. Nuclear engineers believed this system could limit radioactive emissions to 0.1 percent. The data we recovered from the monitoring post clearly contradicts this explanation. So we asked scientists to verify the 0.1 percent theory and see if the venting itself could have released more radiation than expected. This institute in northern Italy specializes in testing nuclear plant safety equipment. It agreed to recreate the conditions of the venting system at Fukushima Daiichi. The first experiment consisted in passing steam through water at the normal temperature. The steam was immediately cooled, creating bubbles that disappeared almost instantly. It means most radioactive particles would also have been trapped in the water. This simulation was consistent with the 0.1 percent theory. But experts who analyzed the nuclear accident believe the situation inside the reactors was different. They say some of the steam generated by the meltdown had interacted with the water before the venting. I think the water temperature was already quite high at that point. In the second experiment, the temperature was raised in the upper layer of water. The influx of steam generated a large amount of bubbles that rose all the way up to the surface. This would have allowed radioactive particles to escape. The result of the second experiment indicates that up to 50% of radioactive elements could have been released into the atmosphere. 
that's 500 times higher than the previous simulation. Our investigation has shown that crucial safety features can fail to perform as expected. It also reminds us that our understanding of what happened inside Fukushima Daiichi remains very limited. Well, TEPCO officials told NHK that they're still trying to find out exactly what happened during the venting process and how much radiation was released as a result. People responsible for disposing Japan's highly radioactive nuclear waste must soon decide where to put it. No municipalities have offered to host a dump as authorities had hoped. Members of a panel last month proposed that the government will have to choose the most scientifically feasible sites by itself. Public opinion on the issue was the focus of a meeting by an expert panel of the Economy, Trade and Industry Ministry. Among the 218 opinions contained in the report, 83 said the government cannot expect public support for disposal. That's unless it shuts down the nuclear plants that produce contaminated materials. 31 doubt whether safe disposal of nuclear waste is even possible in earthquake-prone Japan. But panel members maintain discussions on the future of nuclear plants should be kept separate from the problem of nuclear disposal. They say that's because the waste already exists. The group says it will come up with a final proposal on dump sites considering public comments by mid-May. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, well you say there's no solution to the waste, but there is a solution to the waste, and the solution to the waste is to just leave it exactly where it is, and to have somebody look at it for, for a million years, you know. So, so they just have to have all these zombies who are there at the moment, sitting there doing nothing, who are going to just have to sit there, and their children are going to sit there, and their children's children, and so on, looking at the waste, and making sure that it doesn't leak out of the tanks, and if it starts to look like it's going to leak out of the tanks, they build another tank around that tank, and then they build another tank around the tank that they built around that tank, and so on you know, to infinity. Can you see the way your actions make reactions? Every little thing you do ripples out to infinity. The word you just said, the way you got out of bed, the build up and release of all your forms of energy. Officials from all over the world are meeting in New York to talk about how to control the spread of nuclear weapons. Delegates from 190 nations that have signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty met at United Nations headquarters. They're preparing for a conference next year that will review the treaty. Japanese Senior Vice Foreign Minister Nobuo Kishi says countries that have atomic weapons should hold bilateral negotiations with the aim of abolishing them, but he says multilateral talks are also important. Delegates from the United States and Russia will report on what their countries are doing to reduce their nuclear arsenals. Officials attending the meeting will also discuss the possibility of an international conference to promote a non-nuclear Middle East. The of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have renewed their call for the abolition of nuclear weapons. They were in New York 
like meeting with members, member nations of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Preparations are underway for a conference next year to review the agreement. Hiroshima Mayor Kazumi Matsui said that 69 years ago, the explosion of a single atomic bomb devastated his city in an instant. He called nuclear arms the ultimate inhumane weapon and an absolute evil. We also put in all our effort toward bringing together, together civil society's wishes for nuclear weapons abolition, which transcend national borders and generations. Nagasaki Mayor Tomihisa Taue said countries with nuclear arms should join in the discussions to create a roadmap for the weapons eradication. I urge each of you here today to visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki, witness the reality of exposure to an atomic bomb, and lend your ears to the voices of the aging survivors. 80-year-old Reiko Yamada lived through the atomic bombing of Hiroshima at age 11. All survivors hope with all their hearts that nuclear weapons are abolished in their lifetimes. About 190 countries belong to the NPT. Members review the agreement every five years. years have passed since the world's worst nuclear plant accident. The Chernobyl disaster of April 1986 affected thousands of people. Many still suffer from radiation-related illnesses. And one of them, a 33-year-old woman from Ukraine, has been in Japan sharing her own story at a special commemoration event. NHK World's Takaaki Iwabu reports. Inna Sinukaya arrived in Tokyo last week. Her life has been severely affected by the Chernobyl disaster. 28 years ago, a series of explosions and fire at the plant led to a massive plume of highly radioactive fallout. Parts of Belarus, Ukraine and Russia were the worst hit. Inna was four years old at the time and living in Kiev about 100 kilometers south of the plant. Authorities gave the public little information about the disaster, so her family continued life as usual. Nine years later, she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. When I was diagnosed with cancer, it was the first time that I heard about having been exposed to radiation. It had never crossed my mind before, and I was shocked. Her thyroid was surgically removed. Ina felt embarrassed about the huge scar on her neck. When she was 16, Ina joined other affected children to spend a summer at the therapy center. They were given the chance to have fun together and eat healthy food. The project was supported by a Japanese fund. Ryuichi Hiroka was its founder. He had been covering the disaster as a photojournalist. I tried to persuade doctors there that these children really needed a chance to recuperate at the facility. This time, the same fund invited Inna to Japan to speak about her experiences. When she was pregnant, her doctor strongly recommended an abortion. He said the pregnancy could put her life at risk, fearing her cancer would recur. But she refused to give up on the new life. It was a risk for me, but even if I die, I didn't want to end my child's life. A healthy baby was born. She named her Mariana, now five years old. Mariana gives Inna the strength to carry on. Ina knows there are many people in Japan who are anxious about the effects of the Fukushima nuclear accident. She wanted to share her message of hope. To children, even though it's tough, please be strong. Hold on to your dreams, to want to be someone. I understood that normal life can be affected suddenly by unexpected difficulties. I want to share her message with people in Fukushima and all around Japan. Ina's message of strength and courage is striking a chord with people here in Japan. Takaki Wabu, NHK World, Tokyo.
And since the nuclear accident in Fukushima, local authorities have identified 74 confirmed or suspected cases of cancer among children who were under 18 at the time. But officials say those cases can't be linked directly to the fallout.